the end, you will also know the exact practical steps and strategies you can start using today in your own life. Let's begin. Always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please and impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents, or you might accomplish the opposite. Inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are, and you will attain the heights of power. Transgression of the Law Nicola Fouquet was King Louis XIV's finance minister. In the game of power, Outshining the master may be the worst mistake of all, and unfortunately, it's a very common mistake. But what's worse is that most people aren't even aware they're breaking it. So when they reap the repercussions of their actions, they're bewildered and confused, not knowing what went wrong. Breaking this law can be fatal, and history has proven this, which is why you need to understand this law and learn from the mistakes of others. By the end, you will also know the exact practical steps and strategies you can start using today in your own life. Let's begin. Always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please and impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents, or you might accomplish the opposite. Inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are, and you will attain the heights of power. Transgression of the Law Nicolas Fouquet was King Louis XIV's finance minister. He was indispensable to the king. Fouquet was very clever and had amassed an enormous amount of wealth, living an extremely lavish lifestyle. He was someone of high status, with connections and relationships with the European high society. But as he would soon realize, amassing such wealth and influence would actually cost him his life. When King Louis XIV's prime minister had died, the ambitious Nicolas Fouquet saw this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reach the heights of power. It was literally the highest position in the country, second only to the king himself. And based on his relationship with the king, he had no doubt that he would be named the successor. But instead, the king decided to abolish the position, which made him suspect that he was beginning to fall out of the king's favor. And so, he had an idea to fall back into the king's good graces. To get back in the king's favor, he decided that he would stage the most spectacular party that the world had ever seen in which, in his mind, it would serve as a way to pay tribute to the king, but at the same time, celebrate the completion of his newly built chateau. And the event was truly spectacular. It was attended by the highest of nobility in Europe, as well as some of the most brilliant minds of the time. And it was still unlike anything they had ever seen. Fouquet personally accompanied the king, and even the king himself was astonished by the display of such luxury. The next day, Fouquet woke up and found himself under arrest, and then put on trial for stealing from the country's treasury. He was then found guilty and sentenced to spend the rest of his life in the country's most isolated prison. So what exactly went wrong? Interpretation Louis XIV was an extremely proud and arrogant man. The Sun King wanted to be the center of attention at all times. His ego would never allow him to tolerate absolutely anyone to take the spotlight off him. Fouquet's attempt of paying tribute and demonstrating his loyalty actually sent the exact opposite message. He thought that he should highlight his good taste, connections, and charisma so that he could impress the king, 
making him see that he had all the perfect qualities to be appointed as prime minister, falling back into the king's favor. But unfortunately for him, that was not what he did. Instead, Louis saw this as Fouquet flaunting his wealth and power, and even an open challenge to the king's very own status and authority, so it actually offended him. But more crucially, it led him to feel insecure in his position, so the king could not let this slide. Fouquet had to pay the price. To replace Fouquet, the king then appointed someone he knew would never dare or was even able to outshine him. In fact, he would allow him to continue to steal from the country's treasury, but instead all the money would go straight to the king's hands. And with that money, he would build a palace even more extravagant than that of Fouquet's, hosting parties even more lavish than the ones Fouquet had hosted. Such is the fate, in some form or other, of all those who unbalance the master's sense of self, poke holes in his vanity, or make him doubt his preeminence. Observance The Godfather In The Godfather 2, Michael Corleone was preparing for the deal that would open the doors that would take him to the literal heights of power. One small step looking for a man that wants to be president of the United States, having the cash to make it possible. But he had to go through Hyman Roth, a longtime mob associate and former member of the Corleone Mafia organization under Don Vito Corleone. Although at the time Michael was the most powerful mafia boss in the country, Roth still maintained a very high position and influence among the elite members of the criminal underworld. Roth still viewed himself as a player in the game, even though he acted as if he was just a retired veteran of the Mafia, a wise and generous mentor. But behind that facade and his health-related complications, he nonetheless wanted to remain in control, as he had for years. To him, he was still the master. So, even though Michael was now at the top of the Mafia, and arguably more powerful than Roth, since he still thought of himself as the master, Michael needed to make sure he didn't overtly outshine him. Hence why Michael took the approach of the student, wanting to gain the wisdom and expertise of this wise mentor. Whatever I can do to help Michael. So, Michael applied this law perfectly. He made sure that Roth was secure in his position and that he was his student rather than equal. You're a great man, Mr. Roth. As much I can learn from you. But as we soon find out, Roth had no real interest or intention in actually involving Michael in the deal. Rather, was using it as a mere smokescreen to hide his real intentions. But this didn't need to change Michael's strategy. In fact, playing along as if he knew nothing was the correct move to make, as it allowed him to put Roth at ease. I want him completely relaxed and confident in our friendship. We can also see Roth's insecurity when Michael brings up a very valid point in which challenged what Roth had previously stated. Heard to me, the soldiers are paid to fight, the rebels aren't. What does that tell you? We can win. It's in that blood, believe me, I know. I've been coming here since the 20s. We were running molasses out of Havana when you were a baby. Roth was insecure and did not tolerate anyone attempting to outshine him, and so tried to put Michael down in his place as someone inexperienced and merely a student, that of Roth. Observance. Galileo, the famous astronomer and mathematician, went from having to rely on the generosity of rulers and wealthy families to fund his research and inventions, essentially having to beg for their patronage, to becoming the Medici's official court philosopher and mathematician with a full salary and support, which was something that most scientists of the time could only dream of. In the past, Galileo would gift his inventions and discoveries to the leading patrons of the time, who in turn paid him with gifts rather than cash. But when he discovered the moons of Jupiter in 1610, he decided to adopt a new strategy. 
Instead of dividing the discovery among his patrons, he decided to focus on one, the Medicis. And this was not at random. He specifically chose the Medicis because the founder of the dynasty had made Jupiter the symbol of the dynasty. And of course, they were wealthy enough to fund his projects for a lifetime. Interpretation The brilliance of Galileo's strategy comes down to one simple yet vital concept, making his masters more brilliant than all others, including himself. It was not the significance of the discovery itself that impressed the Medicis. They don't care about its impact on the scientific community. What they care about, the primary reason that they're even willing to spend such large amounts of money on funding such projects, comes down to one thing, glory. And Galileo recognized this and used it to his favor. Instead of attributing them as merely generous funders of a new discovery, Galileo gave them something far more valuable and impactful. He literally aligned their name with the stars, giving them what they truly wanted from such acts of generosity. And so, he got what he wanted, all the while understanding the laws of the game and using them to his benefit so that he could continue to get his financing and a secure position but still ensuring that his masters were also satisfied and would not feel insecure in any way. Therefore, using the glory of his discovery not to outshine the master, rather making the master outshine all others. Keys to Power Unfortunately, not much has changed since the days of the Medicis or Louis XIV. People who acquire a significant position of power view themselves like kings and queens. They want to be the center of attention, the ones superior to those around them in terms of wit, charm, intelligence, and really everything else. They simply don't want anyone to challenge their position, fearing that they will lose everything they worked for. They are constantly on the lookout for potential threats and attempt to deal with them as soon as possible. Therefore, sensing a potential rival inflames their insecurity and then they can become liable to do anything to secure their position. Which today usually means replacing you with someone far less of a threat. So why did Galileo succeed whereas Fouquet failed? Fouquet made the master feel insecure, offending his self-image and ego, making him sense a potential threat that could destabilize his rule and position. Fouquet made the king feel inferior to him, and so the king replaced him with someone far less of a threat. Whereas in the case of Galileo, he gave all the glory of his work and discovery to his master in a way that made them feel directly responsible for the discovery making them outshine not just Galileo, but all of the nobles of Italy. And he did it in a way that was not condescending, a manner that did not offend their intellectual authority and actually seemed somewhat genuine, which in turn gave him what he wanted from the beginning and all parties benefited. In the game of power, the master wants you to remain under them. They can't stand anyone surpassing them. By the way of their own skills and abilities, they want to feel directly involved or the sole reason for your success. Reversal You don't need to be constantly paranoid of offending everyone you meet or interact with, even those above you. The key is to know exactly when. The laws of power state, you must be selectively cruel. If your superior is a falling star, there is nothing to fear from outshining him. Do not be merciful. Your master had no such scruples in his own cold-blooded climb to the top. Gauge his strength. If he is weak, discreetly hasten his downfall. Outdo, outcharm, outsmart him at key moments. The law also states that if he is very weak and is ready to fall, don't get involved. Let nature take its course. Either way, you just need to be patient and wait for the right moment. Power eventually weakens and slowly fades, so the master will someday fall. Play it right. Learn from Fouquet and Galileo. 
and you will then someday have no problem outshining the master. Of course today the consequences may not be as lethal as in the past, but the principles are still exactly the same. The law still applies, even today. But even so, don't take this law too literally. Here's a few ethical ways you can start using this law in your own life. Don't be quick to claim all the glory or credit for your accomplishments without acknowledging those who helped you achieve them, especially those above you such as any mentors or other superiors who have invested and put you in that position. But, and this is very important, make sure you don't overdo it. It becomes unbearable and will have the opposite effect. Try to be as genuine as possible. Secondly, don't show off or flaunt your talents and capabilities at the expense of your superiors. Learn the art of timing. Also, it's naive to think that because you have a great relationship with your superiors, that allows you to do whatever you want. Understand that if you're not careful, you can and will be replaced. One of the most important lessons that the Godfather himself instilled in Don Michael was to keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. But what does that mean, and how can you use it in your own life? Don Vito was actually describing Law 2 of Power. It may initially seem the most evil or Machiavellian law in the laws of power, but if you look deeper, you'll find that there is a somewhat hidden principle that people often overlook, a skill that all those who reach the top of their fields have mastered, and by the end, you too will understand and master this strategy, helping you conquer your goals. Transgression of the Law it's 1955, and Michael Corleone was being prepared to become the new godfather. And when it was time, Michael began his ruthless quest, crushing all those who stood in his way. By the end, he became the undisputed and unchallenged godfather of the entire criminal underworld. It seemed as though he was now invincible, and so no one was going to dare challenge his or the family's position. And now it was time to finally focus on his own personal ambitions. Or so he thought. Through his conquest of the criminal underworld, he had made enemies, very powerful enemies, enemies who do not forget nor forgive, and who would swear revenge no matter how long it would take. A few years later, in 1958, Michael's trusted and loyal underboss, Peter Clemenza, had died from a supposed heart attack. No, no, there was no heart attack. So Michael needed to find a replacement, and fast. But instead of naming one of his capable capos as his new underboss, Michael decided to take a different approach. He named Fredo as the new underboss, a move that many would question within the Corleone family. Now, the top three positions in the organization were occupied by those the Don could absolutely trust, those who were literally part of the Corleone family. But putting Fredo in this powerful position only works because he did the following. He gave the status and power to Fredo, someone he knew that had absolute loyalty to him. But the day-to-day -day operations were passed down to Frankie Five Angels, one of Clemenza's top men, and was often regarded as the real underboss underboss of the family. The reason behind this move is quite interesting. You see, Michael had learned from experience that betrayal from those high in the family's hierarchy leads to disaster. And so, even though he was lucky that his former underboss didn't betray him, there's no guarantee that his other men won't. Anyone was liable to do the same thing. After all, it wasn't personal. It was just business. He could have abolished the position, but he knew that would send the wrong message. Therefore, he gave this position to Fredo, which seemed to be a safer move. But there was a problem. Since Michael was at the top, all eyes were on him, especially those wished to see him fall, and the time had come for him to answer for his previous transgressions. You see, during Michael's journey of climbing to the top of the Mafia, one of the people who had stood in his way was a man called Mo Green, known as the creator of Las Vegas. Now, Mo Green had made two critical mistakes that had sealed his fate, one being worse than the other. The first was refusing an offer from a Corleone Don. The second, and far more consequential, was the fact that he very openly and on multiple occasions disrespected the Corleone family, and there was no going back from that. What Michael overlooked was that Mo Green had many powerful friends, who had profited millions from his casinos, and they didn't want to sit back and just accept the fate of their moneymaker, but very few of them could really do anything about it. Standing up to the Godfather himself seemed impossible, and so had no choice but to move on. 
all except for one man. Hyman Roth was one of the most influential gangsters in the criminal underworld, with a long-established history and reputation in the Mafia. And by now, Roth despised Michael, and his hatred had been festering for years. But following the news about his friend, instead of being rash and reckless, Roth would wait. He held back until the perfect opportunity would arise, and when he saw Fredo be chosen for such an important position, it was finally his time to avenge his fallen friend. Hyman Roth was also an astute master of the game of power, and so he had learned how to masterfully use Law 2 to crush his enemies. To begin this quest for revenge, he would need to wait. However, he was not just sitting idly by waiting for fate to fortune him. Rather, he spent a significant amount of time analyzing Michael. He decided the only way to annihilate the Corleone family was to do it from within. And this is what brings us back to Fredo becoming the Corleone family's underboss. As I'm sure you're aware, Fredo had a well-established reputation of incompetence. But Fredo, he saw himself as someone undervalued, someone whose life was unfair to him and just needed the right opportunity to prove himself. Roth caught this very early on, and once Michael approached him to acquire a few hotels and casinos in Vegas, as well as the whole Havana deal, he now had an easy path to manipulate Fredo to his will. Fredo played a vital role in the assassination attempt at his home, and possibly even thwarted Michael's attempt of finally getting rid of Hyman Roth in Cuba. Roth had hit Michael from where he least expected it, and would bring the Corleone family the closest it's ever been to total annihilation. Interpretation The Don's Mistake the brilliance of Roth's strategy was the fact that even though he was not more powerful than Michael in terms of manpower, wealth, or even connections and status, he still managed to land a deadly blow that Michael would suffer from for the rest of his life. The reason he was incredibly close to finally annihilating the Corleone family was the fact he understood his enemy and identified his weak point a simple strategy that had been used for thousands of years. But the truth is, the biggest key to his success had nothing to do with him. Roth did the smart thing, and as we explained, waited for the perfect opportunity to strike, and played the game right. However, the real reason Roth's attack was so lethal came down to Michael's transgression of the second law of power. Michael thought that Fredo would be grateful to him. After all, he did take care of him and give him everything he wanted, status, money, and power. But he overlooked viewing things from Fredo's perspective, allowing him to slowly grow more and more resentful. The laws of power state, when you decide to hire a friend, you gradually discover the qualities he or she has kept hidden. Strangely enough, it is your act of kindness that unbalanced everything. People want to feel they deserved their good fortune. The receipt of a favor can become oppressive. It means you have been chosen because you are a friend, not necessarily because you are deserving. There's almost a touch of condescension in the act of hiring friends that severely afflicts them. The injury will come out slowly. A little more honesty, flashes of resentment and envy here and there, and before you know it, your friendship fades. The more favors and gifts you supply to revive the friendship, the less gratitude you receive. As you can probably tell by now, this law perfectly encapsulates Michael's situation, although the way Michael dealt with the situation after that is a different discussion. Judgment Be wary of friends. They will betray you more quickly, for they are easily aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical. But hire a former enemy, and he will be more loyal than a friend, because he has more to prove. In fact, you have far more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. Keys to Power In the game of power, you need to surround yourself and acquire the ability to identify those who will best further your interests in all situations. Which essentially means, if you want to succeed in the game of power, or in life in general, you need to surround yourself with those most capable in helping you reach your goals. You probably know and witness firsthand people being put into positions that they are not qualified for. Like what we saw with Michael and Fredo Corleone. The game of power is just that, a game. And to win the game, you need the most powerful pieces on the board. If you don't, when the time comes, your opponent will use it against you. This is a fairly common mistake, something that throughout history many have chosen to ignore and therefore had to suffer the consequences. There are obviously exceptions, and we'll get into them later on. That's one side to it. The core idea of the law is to change your perspective on how you view your so-called enemies and friends. It states that your enemies are an untapped gold mine that you must learn to exploit. And this one idea is the most important thing you need to take away from this video. 
So, what does this all have to do with you? How does this law even apply to our somewhat ordinary lives? Well, as we mentioned, the key idea you should take away is the idea of learning how to use your enemies. And the context can vary depending on your situation, so you could just change the word enemy to opponent or even competitor. In fact, this is something that those who excel in all competitive fields from throughout history have used to elevate themselves to the heights of success in their fields. Without enemies around us, we grow lazy. An enemy at our heels sharpens our wits, keeping us focused and alert. It is sometimes better, then, to use enemies as enemies, rather than transforming them into friends or allies. With all that being said, the question is, should you use this law? As we mentioned previously, and this applies to all the laws of power, the key to mastering the game of power is knowing when to use them. Don't just mindlessly try out these laws without thinking your decisions through. You need to be sure of the context of your situation and decide if this law is applicable to you. Will it grow your power or diminish it? Once again, mastering the art of timing is key. But as Machiavellian as this law initially seems, generally the answer is yes. You definitely should start using the principles we outlined. The idea of using your enemies to your advantage and in the world of business, putting skill and competence above personal relations is all great advice. Definitely something you should be looking into applying to your own life in a positive way. This applies in a number of settings, but specifically in competitive environments. In The Godfather, Don Vito Corleone climbed his way to the top of the criminal underworld, but it came with a hefty price tag. Being at the top made him a target, so he had some extremely powerful enemies, so it was only a matter of time until they would try to dethrone him and crush his empire once and for all. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. While Don Vito was still recovering, the heir to the Corleone empire was taken out. His enemies were closing in. The end was very near. Everything he built, all the years of sacrifice and hard work was about to come crashing down. Drastic measures had to be taken, and fast. The Don knew this very well, but he put his emotions aside and looked at his position strategically, and so utilized Law 3 of the 48 Laws of Power. The law states, keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you're up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. Look, it's no secret that the top players of the game of power abide by a set of very different rules, whether it's in the world of the Godfather or in real life. The rules of the game are the same, so the better you understand the game, the better chance you have to win. This is one of the most important laws of power, so listen closely, as this is something you definitely need to know. Never tell anybody outside the family what you're thinking again. Observance of the Law in 1948, Santino Corleone, the acting boss of the Corleone family, was taken out in a well-planned ambush. Even though Don Vito was out of action, Sonny proved he was a capable strategist and held his own against some of the most powerful men in the country. However, knowing his reckless nature, his enemies used it against him. And so, with the Corleone family's acting Don taken out, it seemed the end was near. But Don Vito, who not too long ago miraculously survived an assassination attempt himself, musters what strength he has left and calls a meeting with the heads of the Mafia families. A few days later in a New York bank conference room, the Dons of all the major families from across the country would meet, the first time in years. The atmosphere was tense, to say the least. Now look, in meetings like these, when people of power sit together in the same room, there's a set of unspoken rules, a code of conduct that they all follow, which is why they all chose their words very carefully. And yes, even bitter enemies can't openly insult or disrespect each other. Instead, they insinuate and indirectly call each other out. Almost every move and every word said by the Dons gave a clue into what they were actually thinking analyzed to see what the real motive was behind it. So pretty much every word and every glance was carefully dissected by the others in an attempt to uncover what they were really thinking. Knowing this, each Don was extremely careful in choosing their words and projecting a certain tone, making it seem as if they were speaking a language of their own. Now, Don Vito had two main objectives he wanted to achieve, and we'll get to them in a minute. But first, look at how Don Vito handled this situation. Instead of hurling insults and making threats, Don Vito did everything he could to make peace, but with certain conditions, of course. 
He was firm, but in the end took the loss and presented a peaceful way out of this conflict with all the parties involved in agreement. The other Dons couldn't believe their ears, especially Don Barzini. He knew Don Vito was in a bad position, but surrendering that easily? What was his play? Did he actually just overwhelm the Don to the extent he had to concede? Well, yes, it was a sign of weakness, but at the same time, they were all relieved that his conditions were very reasonable, and so they could finally get back to the way things were. No one wanted this war to continue, especially now with Vito back in action. The consequences would be grave. Either way, although somewhat suspicious of the Don's sudden change of heart, Barzini went along with it, slowly realizing the Don had no other cards to play and truly had accepted defeat. But what Barzini was blinded to was the fact that this was all a tactical decision. In the end, Vito got what he wanted. His son Michael returned from Sicily unscathed and now could enter phase two of his plan. Part one, use decoyed objects of desire and red herrings to throw people off the scent. If at any point in the deception you practice, people have the slightest suspicion as to your intentions, all is lost. Do not give them the chance to sense what you're up to. Throw them off the scent by dragging red herons across the path. Use false sincerity. Send ambiguous signals. Set up misleading objects of desire. Unable to distinguish the genuine from the false, they cannot pick out your real goal. Interpretation Don Vito was a realist. He knew he was currently in the losing position. There was no point continuing in a war where he had a lot more to lose. So instead of getting emotional and letting his ego get in the way, Vito saw the reality of his current position and devised a long-term strategy where the family could recover and fight another day. He understood Barzini was trying to turn all the other Dons against him and so didn't allow himself to fall into that trap. What's more impressive is that Vito used a combination of Law 22 and Law 3. We'll discuss the surrender tactic a lot more in our video dedicated to Law 22. But let's look at why Vito's strategy was actually successful even though he gave the other families the upper hand, essentially surrendering to the demands of the other bosses. Let's analyze what Don Vito's two objectives were. The first was to make peace with the other families, to stop the bloodshed and bring back his son unscathed, which was the true, but also the red herring, the decoy he would use to also hide his second objective. His second goal was to find out who the real mastermind was, he knew that there was something not quite right from the beginning. Something was not adding up, and so he needed to solve this mystery. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you probably understand how Don Vito concluded that his real enemy, the true mastermind behind all this, was not Tatalia or Solozzo. Rather, it was Barzini all along. But here's a quick summary. Don Vito's suspicion began right after the meeting with Virgil Solozzo. However, he didn't have enough time to investigate further. Later on, when he heard the news about Sonny, he immediately understood that his suspicions were correct. Something was very wrong about this whole situation, which is why his first orders were to set up a meeting with the other families. This situation was shrouded with a mystery, so he knew that making a drastic move without all the necessary information wouldn't be very wise. He had to confront his enemies in person, and as you know, he was right. Tatalia did not have the brains or the confidence to come up with such a well-made plot, not to mention out-strategize Santino, who from a young age proved himself as a great war general. Don Vito and Barzini have a long history together. Their rivalry stretches back years before Vito became the Don we now know, and so Vito went into the meeting looking for any information, any signs that could reveal to him what was really going on, and sure enough, he got what he wanted. Although up until this point, Don Barzini played the game perfectly. The plan he formulated was a masterpiece. He was unbelievably close. All he had to do to actually win was to follow Law 3 and continue to conceal his intentions, act indifferent, and keep up the persona he had been cultivating so far. But he couldn't help it. Tatalia was too incompetent as a puppet, and so he couldn't resist intervening. But in doing so, he made it quite clear to Vito that he was the true mastermind, giving him the final missing piece to a mystery that had plagued his 
his mind, undoing all the brilliant moves he made to get to this point. And so, this is where Don Barzini made a blunder. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's first break down how exactly Don Vito utilized the laws of power to his advantage. The laws of power state, dangle an object you seem to desire, a goal you seem to aim for in front of people's eyes, and they will take the appearance for reality. Once their eyes focus on the decoy, they will fail to notice what you are really up to. Vito used his real motive, the goal he openly stated, to justify his actions, while underneath, he used it to actually achieve a set of separate goals. And what better decoy to use than wanting his son back from Sicily unharmed? Barzini would have no reason to suspect a thing, therefore giving Vito the upper hand. Now, this isn't to say that Vito in any way was not interested in his son's safety, or was only using it as an excuse, not at all. But what this means is that he used a genuine goal of his to justify his actions and concealed his other goals. He was essentially opening up just enough that the other Dons wouldn't suspect a thing. Instead of closing up and acting suspiciously, making it obvious he also had ulterior motives, Vito hid his real intentions by talking endlessly about his goal, just not his real one, or in this case, not his only one. If Don Barzini had seen through the Don's plan, he would have been a lot more careful and would have seen Michael's bold attack coming a mile away, so Vito had to be very convincing. And sure enough, his strategy paid off. <laughs> Keys to power. Most people are open books. They say what they feel, blurt out their opinions at every opportunity, and constantly reveal their plans and intentions. It is easy and natural to always want to talk about one's feelings and plans for the future but it takes effort to control your tongue and monitor what you reveal. It's shocking how true this is in today's society. I bet you immediately thought of at least two to three different people who fit that exact description. We'll get into that in a minute. So let's put that aside and look at how the masters of the game of power view this concept. First, let's understand why this is the case. Well, the laws of power state that it's natural for you to always want to talk about your feelings and plans for the future, but it actually takes quite a bit of effort to control your tongue and monitor what exactly you reveal. The second reason is that many believe that by being totally honest and open, they're winning people's hearts and showing you their good nature. They are simply wrong. Honesty often acts as a blunt instrument, offending people with the ugly truth of what you really think and feel. And the bigger problem is the fact that when you're very open, you become predictable and familiar. Therefore, it becomes almost impossible to respect or fear you. And power will not accrue to a person who cannot inspire such emotions. So instead, the law states you should master the art of concealing your intentions. Here's why. If you're in a competitive field, it doesn't matter what kind. The more you reveal, the more information and power you are giving your opponent. It's as simple as that. And I'm sure you understand the dangers you create when your opponent has more power than you, especially when you're the one giving it to him. They can then predict your next move, find a weakness of yours to exploit, and then come at you with full force. But if they don't know what you're thinking, if you throw them off the scent, set up misleading objects of desire, they cannot prepare a defense or find your weak point to strike. Done right, you become unpredictable and catch your opponent off guard but done wrong, and they have the slightest suspicions of your real intentions, it will completely backfire, so be careful. In the world of Don Vito, if he was completely open with what he was really thinking, his entire empire would have burnt to the ground in no time. He understood he needed to play the game, especially when the consequences were so extreme. And the same is true with all those in the game of power in some form or the other. From coaches and athletes to CEOs, generals, presidents, and even kings, all play by a different set of rules. The dark truth is that all the top players of the game lay honesty aside in some way to get what they want. I know all this sounds extremely evil and unethical, and it kinda is, but that's the point. We want you to understand how these people think so you can see right through it. And don't worry, we'll give you a more ethical version of the law for you to use in your life, but we need you to understand this concept. Now, with Michael safely back in New York, 
Don Vito can now move to phase two of his plan. It was time to rebuild the Empire, so he would spend the next few years preparing Michael to take over, then to enact the final stage in his master plan, taking out the heads of the other five families. Yes, as we mentioned, Don Vito had always been thinking several moves ahead. He understood the reality of his situation and developed a long-term strategy. The Don was not going to back down. Avenging his son was still one of his highest priorities. Now, some of you might be thinking, didn't he say he was not going to be the one who broke the peace? He swore that he was not going to avenge Sonny? Was he just lying the whole time? And the answer is, actually no, he never broke his vow. Here's why Don Vito actually kept his word. It's actually quite simple. The one who broke the peace wasn't Vito or even Michael, but it was, once again, Don Barzini. You see, Vito knew that this truce was not going to last for long. It was only a matter of time until Barzini was going to make one last major attempt. He even predicted how it was going to happen. Whoever comes to you with this Barzini meeting, he's a traitor. Don't forget that. So with that in mind, Don Vito established an effective counter-strategy. The secret he was holding on to was that the burden of avenging his fallen son was to be passed down to Michael, who at that point no one really knew was actually more ruthless than himself. Michael was essentially his secret weapon. He knew Michael was far more capable than even Sonny, and so the other Dons didn't stand a chance. But to add to that, he also had a plan ready, a final move that was to wipe the heads of the other families conquering New York. He he guided Michael, giving him everything he needed to be able to take care of it. And so, once it was time, Michael would take over and Phase 3 would begin. After the series of attacks on the Corleone family, the end was very near. There were very few moves Vito could make, but fortunately for him, he chose the right one. The reason for Vito's success was the same reason that led to Don Barzini's downfall. Vito followed the law perfectly. He made the smart move and followed through all the way to the end, but Barzini couldn't. In the highest levels of the game of power, especially in the dark world of organized crime, making a mistake like this can only end in one way. I'm sure that you're all well aware that Don Vito was a true master of the game of power and a brilliant strategist, and so analyzing his mentality and tactics is fascinating, especially that they're applicable in some sense in real life. Law 3 is definitely one of the most important, yet most dangerous laws of power. There is still a lot more to cover in this law, so make sure you watch part 2 in order to have the complete picture. We'll give you the practical and ethical version of this law and how to use it in a positive manner, and this time we'll be analyzing someone who is truly the master of this law, even more than Vito, making it one of his key weapons in his arsenal. There is one key that allowed Don Michael Corleone to outsmart and outstrategize a whole list of extremely powerful and intelligent individuals, while also somehow transforming a criminal organization to an international conglomerate. One of the main strategies that allowed Michael to become a master of the game of power was his ability to conceal his intentions. And he's not alone. If you look at any of the true masters of strategy, they all mastered this skill. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu states that all warfare is based on deception, and a vital key for a successful deception-based strategy is knowing when and how to conceal your intentions. This is an extremely powerful skill to master, yet many either have no idea idea how to use it without it backfiring, or don't actually understand what this law truly means. So join us as we guide you through one of the most important laws in the game of power. But I have to warn you, like many of the laws of power, this law can be misinterpreted to seem quite evil, and in some cases it kind of is. But that's the point. We want you to understand how these people think so you can see right through it, but more importantly give you the ethical way to use them to enhance your life. Let's begin. Never let anyone know what you're thinking. Part 2. Use smoke screens to disguise your actions. Deception is always the best strategy, but the best deceptions require a screen of smoke to distract people's attention from your real purpose. The bland exterior, like the unreadable poker face, is often the perfect smoke screen, hiding your intentions behind the comfortable and familiar. If you lead this sucker down a familiar path, he won't catch on when you lead him into a trap. Transgression of the Law 
As we discussed in the previous video, Barzini's plan was brilliant to say the least. However, he made a few critical mistakes that destroyed everything he worked for. Following the peace deal, Don Barzini felt unstoppable. He basically humiliated the Corleone family, who was now being led by an outsider, a kid with no experience, and who seemed to be making every possible mistake. Barzini did this to try to aggravate the Corleone family, to get a reaction in which he could get the other families to turn on them and justify his moves against them. But Michael did not budge. He did not respond to Barzini and continued to let him take over Corleone territory, which of course did not sit well with the family's high-ranking members. Regardless, in Barzini's mind, it was a win-win situation. Either Michael would give him a reason to start an all-out war, in which he had the upper hand, or he could just wait for Don Vito's death, which would cause the Corleone family to enter a civil war, destroying itself from within, where he would then swoop in and take over. He knew Don Vito was the only reason Michael was allowed to lead for this long, and with Vito out of the way, Michael would become an easy target. And that's exactly what happened. Well, sort of. Hatred for Michael began brewing within the ranks of the Corleone family. Betrayal was becoming more and more inevitable. But what Barzini and some of these Corleone members did not understand was that Vito and Michael were already well aware of their situation. Therefore, they were ready for whatever came next. All that was left, the final question that needed to be answered, was who? Who was the traitor? And after the Don's funeral, just as he predicted, the traitor finally revealed himself, giving Michael everything he needed to make the most audacious move in the history of the criminal underworld. The final move of a plan Don Vito had set and concealed years ago. Interpretation like we mentioned in the previous video, this was no more than a tactical retreat. Don Vito knew what he was doing, playing it very carefully where it ultimately led to this point. With the guidance of Vito, Michael knew the signs to look for to find the traitor. Whoever comes to you with this Barzini meeting, he's the traitor. Don't forget that. Again, instead of confronting Tessio, he played along, using him to put his enemies at ease, making them completely oblivious to what was coming next. Michael did not make open threats or any slight remarks that could have led Barzini or even Tessio to suspect a thing. And what many don't realize is that Barzini attempted to use this law, but ultimately failed. He thought that his intentions were concealed, that his smokescreen was thick enough to distract his enemy from his real goals. But Don Vito saw right through him. Remember, Barzini still thought that Vito believed it was Tatalia responsible for this war, not realizing the blunder he made during the commission meeting. And so he played along thinking the Corleone family did not know who their real enemy was. He used Vito's funeral as his coronation, not hiding the fact that he was essentially celebrating that the number one obstacle in his way was finally gone. So even if Vito had not warned Michael of what was going to happen, the way Barzini conducted himself made it quite obvious what his intentions were. The thought never crossed his mind that Vito had been thinking several moves ahead from the very beginning. He failed to see that the war was by no means over. He was in a world of his own. His ego and short-sightedness allowed him to fall right into Michael's trap. Very common, yet deadly mistake. Keys to power. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu states that all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we're able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe that we are far. When far, we must make him believe we are near. This is a key principle in formulating a successful strategy, which is why it ties in perfectly with what Law 3 is advocating. Concealing your intentions in addition to creating a smokescreen is the recipe for a successful deception-based strategy. And this is what this law is about. It gives you the advantage of preventing your opponent from anticipating your next move, therefore not giving them the ability to defend against it. It's important that you understand that deception is not usually extremely grand and elaborate. In fact, the law states that being overly flashy actually raises suspicions. Instead, the deception is usually hidden behind the bland and inconspicuous. Both Roth and Michael are law. Like a skilled poker player, they reveal nothing. They maintain a bland exterior that then confuses and infuriates their opponents, not giving them any signs or clues on what to expect. Remember, appearances can be misleading. Let's look at Hyman Roth, for example. In the beginning, 
beginning, he seems like an unassuming and kind old man. He acted as a mentor of sorts to Michael, an old friend of his father's whose only goal was to pass down his knowledge. But as you know, later on we find out that Roth was in fact the head of the snake, the real puppet master who had been behind the attacks on Michael. From Fredo to the Rosado brothers, Hyman Roth was the one using them as pawns in his much larger scheme. We'll talk a bit more about Roth in a minute, but the key idea is that appearances alone are not enough. They can be easily used to deceive. The most effective forms of a smokescreen are actually quite subtle. Putting on a bland exterior that does not reveal what you're thinking is a very powerful tool. A few offhand comments, simple facial expressions, or even better, lack thereof, make for a very effective smokescreen. In this scene, we see both Roth and Michael, who have two separate agendas that they are both trying to hide. You're a wise and considerate young man. And you're a great man, Mr. Roth. As much I can learn from you. Whatever I can do to help Michael. That such a thing could be possible. And Pantangeli is a dead man. You don't object. These small potatoes. I know what you're thinking, but listen, watch till the end and it will become a lot more clear. And if you haven't already, you need to be part of the Culture Mafia, so make sure you're subscribed. Have you ever heard of a skillful general who intends to surprise a citadel, announcing his plan to his enemy? Conceal your purpose and hide your progress. Do not disclose the extent of your designs until they cannot be imposed, until the combat is over. Win the victory before you declare the war. In a word, imitate those warlike people whose designs are not known except by the ravaged country through which they have passed. Observance of the Law the assassination attempt on Don Vito sent shockwaves across the country, especially within the criminal underworld. The five families were all on high alert, anxiously waiting for the inevitable war to come. The man behind this attack, Virgil Solozzo, was quick to send the Corleone family a peace deal, in which they would need to come to terms with the fact that Don Vito was gone, and if they were to survive, they needed to accept his deal. But unfortunately for Solozzo, the Don survived, which complicated things even more. They hit him with five shots and he's still alive. He thought that with the Don out of the way, Sonny would have no choice but to accept his peace deal. But now that there was the possibility that Don could recover, he knew he was in deep trouble. From the Corleone family's perspective, Sonny had two options. Either accept a ceasefire and not risk an all-out war, in which without Don Vito, they would be much more vulnerable. Then just wait and hope that Vito recovers soon enough to figure out what their next move should be. Or he can go all out and not risk making the family or himself look weak, which can be justified because even with a ceasefire, the other families could conspire against him and therefore give them the advantage. Besides, the Corleone family was by far the most powerful mafia family and could withstand taking on all the families at once. But again, this comes with its own set of issues. Firstly, sooner or later their allies and connections will begin to abandon them, as an all-out war would bring too much heat on everyone involved. And so if it meant that they could end this war, at some point they would switch sides. After all, it's not personal, it's strictly business. And that leads us to the second major problem. An all-out war is bad for business, and without any money coming in, having to pay for an expensive war would be catastrophic, bankrupting the family. War's costing us a lot of money. Nothing's coming in, we can't do business. Well, neither can they. Even so, they decided to make the bold move and take that risk. They were hoping that by taking out Solozzo, everything else would fall into place, making it easier to negotiate a better deal and remind the other Dons that the Corleone family was not to be trifled with. We'll be looking into this whole situation and who was to blame for it in our next next video, so for now, we'll focus on analyzing Michael's meeting with Solozzo. Following the assassination attempt on Vito, Solozzo sends Sonny his terms for a peace deal, and specifically asks for Michael to be the one to meet him and represent the Corleone family's interests. As you recall, Michael was the one who suggested that he should actually take him out during the meeting. It was not going to be easy. Solozzo expected they would try something, so he had placed numerous precautions, and to his credit, most of them worked. During the meeting, Solozzo could see Michael's hatred towards him. All his frustration and anger were quite visible. He even sensed Michael's nervousness. And what's interesting is that Michael didn't try to hide it. In the end, Michael sat with Solozzo and continued to play his role perfectly all while the smokescreen had completely enveloped Solozzo, making him completely blind to what Michael was going to do next. There's a lot to unpack in this scene, so here's everything you need to know. Interpretation 
Let's take a closer look at how the meeting went down. Solozzo was trying to uncover what Michael was thinking. He was looking for any signs. Even the subtlest of facial expressions could give him all the information he needed. But Michael gave him nothing. And what really sealed the deal was the fact that Michael did not try to be overly enthusiastic or try too hard to put Solozzo at ease. He was truly angry, but at the same time somewhat nervous, and actually let it slip out a little bit. Solozzo saw this, and that's actually what made him trust Michael. He thought that Michael was trying to conceal these feelings, and so in his mind he had broken through Michael's smokescreen. This worked to Michael's advantage, because if he started acting too friendly, Solozzo would have immediately known that something was not quite right. From the very beginning, this was an extremely risky plan. There were so many things that could have gone wrong. However, there were also quite a few factors that actually played to their advantage. The first was the fact that Solozzo himself was the one who wanted Michael to represent the Corleone family, although maybe he was not the Corleone family's first first option, it actually ended up working in their favor, because Solozzo overlooked the fact that Michael was a war veteran, so not exactly a harmless civilian. But besides all that, the key to Michael's success was his ability to conceal his intentions. He sat right in front of Solozzo, knowing that in a few minutes, he was going to take him out. So what was Michael's smokescreen in this situation? Well, it's actually quite simple. Michael's genuine concern was the perfect smokescreen. He also didn't try too hard to conceal his anger or the contempt he felt toward Solozzo, and it was exactly those little details that allowed Michael to deceive Solozzo and made him loosen his guard. This is something we see throughout Michael's rise, and as you recall, the laws of power state that the bland exterior, like the unreadable poker face, is often the perfect smokescreen. And there is no doubt, Michael executed it perfectly, not letting Solozzo see past his raw anger and even nervousness, in which he also cleverly used to enhance the smokescreen, is what allowed this plan to actually succeed. Reversal Here's where the law will not work and even backfire. It's important you understand this, so listen closely. No smokescreen, red herring, false sincerity, or any other diversionary device will succeed in concealing your intentions if you already have an established reputation for deception. But generally overusing this law, even if you succeed in using it, will negatively affect you in the long run. It differs depending on the situation, so it's up to you to determine when it's the best move to make, because there are many situations where actually stating your intentions very openly is actually more suitable, and even the better diversionary tactic. Real Life out of all the laws of power, Law 3 is quite interesting for a multitude of reasons. But once again, none of these laws should always be taken too literally, without considering the time and place you will be using these laws, as sometimes following them is essentially the logical move to make. The key is knowing how and when to use them. Now, to those of you who might be thinking, there is no possible way that using these principles can ever be moral. Or say things like, all these laws are outdated, they don't exist in our society today. Well, are you sure about that? The idea that this law cannot be applied today is simply not true. Look no further than any professional athlete, entrepreneur, lawyer, CEO, president, and any other fields that require having a competitive edge. Entire industries exist that help companies and even countries achieve this. But besides all that, it's extremely unwise to constantly blurt out your opinions at every opportunity you have. Constantly revealing your plans, even in our somewhat ordinary lives, can come with some unintended consequences. But this doesn't mean you should go to the other extreme, where you completely close up up, but instead try being more conscious of what you reveal, primarily in a competitive setting, or if you're trying to acquire power. It's all about understanding the situation and mastering the art of timing, so that you can determine whether or not it's appropriate in that particular situation. Again, like most of these laws, they're seen as a standard practice in competitive environments. The biggest example of people breaking this law are people who spend countless hours on social media. Don't be too consumed in constantly seeking validation. Instead, enjoy and celebrate your victories. Don't just use them for validation. Once again, if it's something you really want, there is always a time and place for you to indulge that urge. But social media aside, when we look at people in competitive fields, they immediately give the other side the advantage if they're quick to expose what they're thinking or planning to do. And this is especially true in the game of power. The law states that you should only unveil your intentions once it's too late for your opponent to counter it. Do not disclose the extent of your designs until they cannot be opposed. 
closed until the combat is over. Win the victory before you declare the war, which is also something that's emphasized in Law 9. Also, one of the biggest advantages you gain by understanding these laws, you will begin to see right through those who try to use them against you. Our goal with these videos is to translate these laws into practical and ethical tools to enhance your career and really just your life in general. At the very least, it will give you insights on how the game of power works and equip you with the tools to counter them. Now, the next law of power ties in perfectly with what we just discussed and can prove vital in your own life. In The Godfather, during an important meeting between Don Vito Corleone and the mysterious Virgil Solozzo, Sonny Corleone makes a catastrophic mistake, and thanks to their enemies, the entire Corleone family would have to pay the price. But what exactly did he do, and why was it so significant? Well, this is where understanding Law 4 of the 48 Laws of Power becomes essential. The Laws of Power state, when you're trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear, and the less in control. Even if you're saying something banal. It will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended, and sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. In your own climb to power and success, this is a law you need to master. As you know, the higher up you get, the more ruthless and cutthroat the competition gets, and so having this law in your arsenal is vital. If you master this law, you will develop an aura of power and will seem more profound. This is not something that's reserved for the likes of Vito or Michael Corleone, but can be used by anyone in almost all areas of life. Even the famous artist Andy Warhol was known to have utilized this law to great effect. We will also provide you with everything you need to know to use this law in an ethical way. It will make you a better and more considerate person. Watch to the end to find out how. Once again, I have to warn you, using these laws is an art. It takes time and effort to master, and the danger comes when you don't understand when and how to use them. Therefore, it could completely backfire if you don't follow these principles, so listen closely so you don't end up like Sonny. Law 4. Always say less than necessary. Transgression of the Law in 1945, a mysterious figure had been trying to set up a meeting with Don Vito for a few weeks now. During this time, Tom Hagen had been investigating this man and provided the Don with a bit more information about this shadowy figure. This man was Virgil the Turk Solozzo. He was known as the top narcotics man, who gained this reputation thanks to his elaborate setups in both Turkey and Sicily which also allowed him to build some serious connections. At the time, some families were already working on this field. However, it was done on the low. No one wanted to be caught doing it, as it was outlawed by the commission. But it was so profitable that some took the risk anyway. But Solozzo was not looking to set up a small operation. He wanted to take it nationwide, including within the Corleone family's territories. He wanted to be the head supplier for the entire country. But for Don Vito and most of the other Dons, the drug trade was very taboo. It was seen as a filthy industry, and since they viewed themselves as men of honor, they didn't want anything to do with it. But besides all that, they understood that this trade came with a lot of risk. Up until now, they could easily bribe the officials to allow them to continue to operate their operations. But the drug trade is where they seem to draw the line. Therefore, they would have to suffer the consequences. Maybe not now, but definitely in the years to come. Which is why Don Vito knew what his answer was going to be even before meeting with Solozzo. He still took the meeting out of respect but mainly to see what information he could extract from this Virgil Solozzo. A few days go by, and the time for the meeting has come. The Don listens attentively to the Turk's proposition, while also trying to extract as much information as possible. Solozzo then makes an offer that almost no one could refuse. Sonny shows interest, but the Don immediately shuts him up. The Don gives Solozzo his final answer and wishes him luck. Well, now it's final, and I wish to congratulate you on your business. I know you do very well. And Good luck to you. Not too long after, Vito was ambushed outside his headquarters and was now in a critical condition. Rumors of his death had become widespread. Now, we all know that this attack was directly correlated with the meeting Don Vito had earlier. So let's analyze what actually happened and who was to blame. Interpretation We've mentioned this before during meetings between powerful people. Every word counts. So pretty much every word and every glance was 
carefully dissected by the others in an attempt to uncover what they were really thinking. This meeting was no different, and Sonny gave Solozzo all the information he needed. But what was the big deal? All Sonny did was ask a simple question, a response to an offer Solozzo had made. Why was it so significant? While all that is somewhat true, Sonny, however, did a little bit more than just ask a question. You see, Solozzo was at this meeting to do anything possible to get the Don on board. Vito was vital for this deal to go through. His answer would determine if the deal would succeed. So Solozzo tried to put the Don's mind at ease by stating that Vito's investment of $1 million, which by the way would be the equivalent of $15 million today, would be guaranteed by the Tatalia family, which means there would be zero risk for Vito. Solozzo was a very smart man. He knew that there was a high chance that the Don would refuse, so he went in with the goal to gather some vital intel that could be exploited later on, and Sonny gave him exactly what he was looking for. Let's look at how Vito instantly responded to hearing this offer compared to Sonny. So I received 30% for finance, political influence, and legal protection. That's what you're telling me. That's right. Why do you come to me? Why do I deserve this generosity? Oh, are you telling me that the Talia's guarantee our investment? Wait a You see the difference? Instead of showing a united front, Sonny gave away the fact that the proposition was very enticing. However, Vito wanted to play it differently, but it was now too late. It showed a clear divide between the older and younger generation, and as you know, Solozzo would exploit this vital intel. He saw this as an opening, a crack within the seemingly unbreakable Corleone armor. This was the opportunity he needed to achieve his goal. And as we later find out, Solozzo was not only backed up by Philip Tattaglia, rather the head of the snake was the cunning Don Emilio Barzini, who he relayed this information to and helped Solozzo formulate this masterful plan. In their mind, if they could take out Don Vito, they would overwhelm the Corleone family to such an extent they would have no choice but to submit, make peace, accept the loss, and move on and then force Sonny to take this deal. So what should have Sonny done? Well, to start with, he should have kept quiet and left Don Vito to do all the talking. At least then it would have been a lot harder for Solozzo to find out what they were thinking. Solozzo was clearly trying to bait them out, and with the help of Sonny, he definitely succeeded. Which is why the Don reminds Sonny, although too late, the importance of not letting your opponent know. What you thinking again? The fact that you should not be so open that you continuously say more than necessary. Vito was trying to explain to Sonny that a person who cannot control his words shows he cannot control himself and is unworthy of respect. And since Sonny was to be done one day, this is a lesson he needed to understand. But let's look at why Vito took this extremely seriously. Other than the reasons we mentioned earlier, Sonny was sabotaging Vito's efforts to find out what was really going on. He was very suspicious of Solozzo and this deal in its entirety. He sensed there was something strange going on and needed to put Solozzo at ease so he could buy enough time to find find out what was really going on. But a combination of Sonny's outburst and the fact Don Barzini was already several moves ahead of Vito all led to this extremely well-laid-out plot, the perfect checkmate. So, although there's some blame that it should be attributed to Vito, the primary reason that emboldened Virgil Solozzo and led to one of the most elaborate plots in the history of the criminal underworld was because Sonny could not control his words and said more than necessary. Keys to power. The game of power is in many ways a game of appearances, so when you say less than necessary like a Don Vito or even Michael, you inevitably appear more powerful than you are, which is one of the keys that establish their aura of power. But why is this the case? How does saying less than necessary give you any sort of advantage? Well, the laws of power break it down quite brilliantly. You see, your silence will make other people uncomfortable. Humans are machines of interpretation and explanation. They have to know what you're thinking. When you carefully control what you reveal, they cannot pierce your intentions or your meaning. History is littered with individuals who refuse to apply this law and pay the ultimate price. Your words are extremely powerful. They could either be used for you or just as easily used against you. It all depends on how you use them. When you reveal less than necessary, the silence and short answers puts them on the defensive. They will try to fill in the gaps you left, the intolerable silence with all sorts of comments that then reveals valuable information about 
about them and their own weaknesses. After they leave the meeting with you, they will feel as though they've been robbed, now left to ponder your every word. And as the laws of power state, this extra attention to your every word will no doubt add to your power. A perfect example of this is Michael's meeting with Senator Geary, or even Vito's meeting with the commission. They both did not do the majority of the talking, only making a few comments throughout, as well as vaguely responding to their demands. But when they spoke, everyone listened. On the other hand, you not only cultivate a powerful appearance by saying less, but you also don't run the risk of saying something that you might later regret. You won't believe how common this is, not just today, but throughout history. Instead of just staying quiet and waiting for the right opportunity, therefore sacrificing the short-term satisfaction of responding for the sake of securing the long-term benefits. Here is the core of this law, the most important thing you need to take away from this law. Once the words are out, you cannot take them back. The law warns to be especially careful with sarcasm. And to add to that, you should be cautious of any comments that could provoke or embarrass someone. The momentary satisfaction you'll gain will be outweighed by the price you'll have to pay. Observance of the Law during the reign of King Louis XIV, his ministers and advisors would spend days debating how to relate to him the different issues of the empire. They would be obsessed with the phrasing, trying to think of what would appeal to him and how he would interpret what they were saying. Even small details, such as what facial expressions, should have needed to be planned beforehand. Every detail needed to be accounted for. When the fateful moment would finally come, they would present to him the issues at hand, while he listened in silence, with an enigmatic look on his face that did not reveal any emotion. In the end, he would say, I shall see, and walk away. That would be the first and last time they would discuss the matter with the king. They only found out what he thought weeks later, when he had made the decision and put it into action. Interpretation at the height of his power, Louis XIV was known to be a man of few words. His most famous remark was, I am the state. He used his other signature phrase, I shall see, in all kinds of scenarios. Both these remarks are incredibly concise, yet extremely powerful. His own ministers and advisors would have no idea what he was thinking. The only information they could work off of was the actual result, the decision he ended up making. But other than that, they had no clue what the king's thoughts or intentions were. They could not decipher whether or not they had pleased or angered him until it was too late. And that was the point. It worked perfectly for Louis, as his court couldn't just tell him what he wanted to hear. They tried to find a pattern in his decision-making. But other than that, they were left in suspense, not knowing the result of what they said. He let them talk on and on, and the more they talked, the more they revealed about themselves. The silent Louis would keep this valuable information in mind, and later use it against them. But he was not always like this. As a younger man, he was literally quite the opposite. But through the years, Years, he developed this mask to keep all those below him off balance and in fear. What's even more interesting is how Don Vito and Michael Corleone adopted this method and took it to a whole new level. In fact, the similarity between Michael and Louis XIV is actually quite remarkable. When Michael ascended to the rank of Don, he carefully managed who had access to him and what information they were allowed to hear. He compartmentalized each division of his empire so there would be few links between them, and he was always in the center. The only one who knew everything that was going on. It was quite a rigid structure to ensure no one other than him knew too much about what he was thinking or what he was saying. They would all report to Michael with any important information or issues at hand, but would need to wait after that until they received orders from the Don. Even Tom Hagen, Michael's consigliere, was not always sure what Michael was up to. Michael was also infamously a man of few words, especially when dealing with his opponents. This gave him an aura of power and made whatever he said said seem quite profound. Even Don Vito from the early days when he was trying to convince Don Fanucci to give him more time, he did not overplay it, rather carefully chose his words, giving him just enough information not to suspect him. Reversal even Michael Corleone, who infamously never revealed what he was thinking and always said less than necessary, understood that at times it is unwise to remain silent. Being vague and ambiguous can leave your words open to interpretation, which can be extremely risky. So sometimes saying more, being a bit louder, playing a fool can be advantageous. It could be as simple as analyzing the person's reactions to what you say, how they respond to your good or bad news. Things like analyzing micro-expressions can be extremely 
extremely powerful, giving you a glimpse into what the other person is thinking, providing you with valuable information. The law also states that the more you talk, the less suspicious you appear, since it's harder to suspect you are hiding something. But once again, like all the laws of power, the difference between those who succeed and those who get wiped out is knowing when and how to use them. Real Life so how does this apply in your own life? And more importantly, how should you use it? Well, what's interesting about this law is that it can be a tool used in many different situations. Once you truly realize the power your words have and understand that once they're out, you can't take them back since the damage is already done, you are then in control and might just save yourself from making a catastrophic mistake. There's an endless list of situations in your own life where applying this law is vital. Again, this law should be used within the right context. Timing is everything, and knowing when and how to apply these laws is an art when mastered can be extremely powerful. So to answer the question, it's a definite yes. Although this law is definitely more effective in competitive situations, particularly during a negotiation or business meeting, it can be used in your personal life, since the thinking process is pretty much exactly the same. Here's how you do it. Next time, before you say something, ask yourself, is it necessary? How will they interpret what I'm saying? Is this going to give me momentary satisfaction and cost me heavily later on? Will this come back to bite me? What could be the consequences? Of course, you won't always be able to predict the other person's reaction, but at least you become more aware of the more obvious potential consequences. And it should go without saying at this point, you should use these laws sparingly, only in the right context. You won't always have time to analyze what you're about to say, but being aware of the danger is good enough. With time and practice, it will become a lot easier. Remember this, saying less than necessary is not just for kings and powerful people. There are a lot more hidden secrets within this law that we want to share with you. If you're interested in learning a lot more of the secrets and wisdom that all the masters of the game of power have used to elevate their status and power and gain the knowledge that will help you in your own journey, I highly recommend subscribing to our new weekly newsletter where we'll be sharing the same priceless insights that will help you no matter what your goal is. It will focus on the things we constantly discuss on this channel. Respect, power, and wealth. Keys that are not openly discussed, which means they will get you ahead of your competition in no time. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next video. In the game of power, outshining the mass.
In the game of power, outshining the master may be the worst mistake of all, and unfortunately, Pelota. 